I am just thrilled to see all these people. This is great. So welcome to the Organic Lawn Care and Landscaping webinar. I'm Lucy Kayard and I work for MOFCA as the Southern Maine Outreach Coordinator. I hope everyone's doing well. Tonight we're going to be hearing from two awesome fellows, Caleb Goosen, who is the uh, Organic Crops Specialist for MOFCA. Um, and yes, there, Caleb is waving. <laughs> and um, Jeremy Blakelock, who um, is the owner, there's the other wave, of Seaflower Garden and Design in Rousick. And he's also on the MOFCA board. So uh, as many of you know, MOFCA stands for Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. Um, we are a broad-based community um, that educates about and advocates for organic agriculture, um, illuminating its interdependence with a healthy environment, local food production, and thriving communities. That's our mission statement. Um, we have about 10,000 current members, which is exciting. And um, we are most well known for the Common Ground Country Fair, which is held every September, um, the third weekend after Labor Day. And um, MOFCA Certification Services certifies about 550 operations um, in Maine currently, although always rising, which is great. And um, the is a part of is um, responsible for providing technical support um, to those certified farmers and producers, um, as well as um, technical support to MOFCA staff. They are very <laughs> important for that as well. And MOFCA also hosts educational programming throughout the year like this to anybody who's interested. So you don't have to be a farmer, um, a certified farmer to take part in our wonderful programming. Uh, so in a moment, you're going to be hearing first from Jeremy, um, who will talk about organic landscaping and um, some general organic um, information, which is very helpful, and his business, I'm sure. Without further ado, Jeremy, if you would like to unmute yourself, you may proceed. Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a lovely evening. Uh, I don't want to look out the window right now because there's snow on the daffodils that just started blooming. So it's good to be inside and uh, meeting all of you. So I'm gonna start a uh, screen share since I have some slides. So bear with me. All right. So like Lucy said, I am a landscaper. I've been doing landscaping since 1993 when I was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I was hired by a lovely woman aptly named Rose Field, who uh, was one the only organic landscaper in Pittsburgh, which was perfect for me because I grew up on an organic farm here in Maine. So from that beginning, I've never looked back and I've been a landscaper ever since. Um, So first, there's a couple of broad questions I'd like to go over. It's like, why do we do organic at all? And also, what does organic even mean in this context of landscaping and, and flower gardening? As you probably know, the federal government now runs the National Organic Program, which legally defines what is organic and what is not organic. And there's organizations like MOFCA who certify producers all across the, the country in those practices. <clears throat> Excuse me. That program is only designed really for food and fiber. So it's not something that's specifically tailored to landscaping or you know, perennial gardens or anything like that. Um, since that's the case, there's a couple organizations that I know about who have developed their own um, standards and certification. Uh, one of them is NOFA, which is the Northeast Organic Farming Association. That's sort of like MOFCA for the rest of New England. 
and there's different chapters in each of the other New England states. Uh, they came up with an organic land care course and certification standard. Uh, I think it was primarily the Massachusetts and Connecticut chapters that did that. Um, and they have uh, produced a lovely booklet here, which uh, if you go to organiclandcare.net, you can get yourself a, a copy of it. Um, and in 2004, I believe, I took their course uh, down in Connecticut. Um, I did not get certified because not very many people here in Maine know about NOFA, but I believe there are at least a few landscapers in Southern Maine who do have that certification. Uh, there's also the Ecological Landscape Alliance. They have a, a really great website with a lot of resources on it. I don't know if they actually do certification or not, but they're sort of a uh, trade group for a lot of landscapers who are towards the greener side, the more ecological side of, of landscaping. And I do want to preface this talk and just make sure we know that we're all talking about a garden here or a landscape, which is, even though we're attempting to mimic some of the natural processes, this is a human construct and it really has our ideas of what's pretty and aesthetic and what's useful as a, as a baseline. So that really plays into some of the choices that we're gonna be making uh, when we are gardening in our yards. So when we talk about organic, I'm sure a lot of people have their own ideas of what it means and there's a lot to it. Um, these are four basic principles that we incorporate it into anything we call organic as far as growing. <clears throat> I'm not going to read them to you. Um, you can read them, but it's just sort of a very condensed baseline. There's definitely other principles that you could put into that list, but for the sake of this sort of basic course, that's what we're gonna consider. And so why do we even want to be organic? So I think a lot of people are really focused on avoiding any harm to the environment. As, you know, we hear a lot of stories about what pesticides are doing to, to insects and the bees and frogs. We hear stories about human health problems that are a result of some of these chemicals. There's problems with nutrient runoff that are causing problems with our lakes and rivers and estuaries. So a lot of people I think start at this, at this place where they want to avoid doing any harm. Now, if we go beyond avoiding doing any harm, then we can actually get moved to a place where we're healing or enhancing the environment. So instead of just having an inert soil, we're actually promoting the health of the soil with compost and we're increasing the amount of biological activity going on in the soil so that the entire ecosystem around our, our property is a healthier ecosystem because the soil food web, as they say, is so important for the health of any plant, natural or one that you planted. So it's really to the benefit of everybody that we not have these sort of dead zones in the middle of, of the environment that a lot of conventionally managed landscapes can become. 
Also, we can have more biodiversity in our landscape, you know, especially in some of the uh, more suburban or urban areas. There's just not a whole lot of, of variety of plants there. And most of it's just like turf grass and, you know, a handful of very common trees. So by having a good mix of plants in our gardens, we can support birds, we can support the pollinators, we can support the bee, other bees and butterflies and you know, monarchs has been a big thing lately. And uh, lastly, this occurred to me briefly, um, assuming that most of you are from Maine. Um, and recently, some of the municipalities in Maine, um, notably Portland and South Portland, have come up with local ordinances heavily restricting the use of synthetic pesticides. So I thought maybe, well, maybe some of you have come here solely to be able to comply with those ordinances. Um, so that's a minor reason, but it is going to be uh, probably more and more prevalent across this country, hopefully. So circling back to avoiding harm, and how do we avoid a lot of these toxic substances that are so prevalent in, you know, the, the gardening aisle at Home Depot. Um, so really the first thing that I always like to do is design a landscape where the plants are not stressed because a stressed plant is not a happy plant and it's going to need more human intervention to, to be look good, basically, since that's really the goal of gardens. Um, so looking at site conditions, for example, you know, we're not, we've probably all seen a rhododendron in a little narrow strip in an asphalt parking lot, you know, not the right place for that plant. And it's always going to suffer and it's always going to be susceptible to disease and insect problems. So also things like soil conditions. If you have a boggy area, just go with the boggy area and put like an iris in instead of trying to plant a rose there because a rose is never going to thrive in a boggy area. Now, of course, some pests are sort of inevitable you can go down to the next to last point and just live with a little damage. Um, various people have various tolerance for holes in their leaves, um, which is fine. Um, but I like to start with what they call integrated pest management or IPM. And that is really a process of doing your homework before you do any intervention. So you should always try and figure out like what is making the hole in your leaf. And once you know what that is, well, you know, perhaps it's a particular grub, but maybe there's only one part of the year when it's going to be there. Or maybe there's only one part of the year where it's actually susceptible to a spray. And, and if you try and do it other times, you're just wasting your time and spraying toxic stuff everywhere. So, and you know, there's, there's times where you want to start with sort of something that's the least toxic. So if, like if you have aphids, for example, the least toxic thing is just to blast them off the plant with the hose, as opposed to doing some sort of poison. And even with, you know, so-called organic pesticides, I believe almost all of them are broad spectrum pesticides. 
So they will kill any insect that gets hit by them. So you want to make sure that you're just spraying the plant that has a problem, for example, and not just say, oh, I'm just going to spray the whole garden to make sure I get them all, because you'll probably be doing more harm than good at that point. Um, excuse me for a minute. So one of the other things to avoid toxins is in mulch, actually. There's a few issues that I've come across and read about. Um, I never use colored mulch, artificially colored mulch, just because I really don't know what that chemical is, and I'd really rather not deal with it, you know, aesthetic issues aside. Um, and there's also been a case, or several cases, I believe, after Hurricane Sandy, there was so much demolition wood from New Orleans that was being chipped up, dyed, bagged, and sold as mulch. So that is definitely one product that I avoid. Uh, I just use a shredded uh, bark mulch for the most part. You really want it to be mostly bark because the... Uh, Uh, if it's all wood chip, then the soil fungi really start going to work on the wood chips and they're not doing their other function, which is freeing up nutrients for the roots of your plants. So your nutrients or your plants actually can become like nitrogen star because of that little process. So, And uh, speaking of nutrients, nutrients can become a toxin too. Um, is that this picture is taken at the, the head of um, Coit Bay in Brunswick. So there's like stairs down to the beach right behind that bed. So that's not some place where I really want to be spreading a lot of excess nutrients as far as fertilizer. So, you know, do a soil test, figure out what you actually need before you just automatically spread nitrogen every spring. Uh, I'm not going to go through specific uh, products as far as pest control and um, or even fertilizer brands or anything like that. Um, generally, if products are okay for organic use, they have a label on them somewhere that says OMRI listed, O-M-R-I. Uh, I don't remember what that acronym stands for, but it's the list of things that are okay for organic production in agriculture. So if they're okay for that, they're probably a better alternative for your home garden, even if it's a, a perennial garden. Um, so this is not really avoiding comp, uh, toxics. This is the next step, which is enhancing things. But if you're not putting any of this stuff into the landfill, any of your yard waste, something like six or seven percent of all stuff that goes into a landfill is yard waste, um, which is just ridiculous because any of that could be diverted. It doesn't need to be in there. And also the bigger problem in my mind is organic matter in landfills is what produces methane, which is, as you probably know, a big uh, greenhouse gas, the worst greenhouse gas. So composting is good for avoiding problems and it's also great for your soil. It has a lot of microbes, it has some nutrients, it has great potential for uh, water retention so that your soil doesn't dry out so well, so much. It improves the structure of the soil so it's not so pack compacted and roots can grow in it. Um, I probably don't have to brag, you know, tell you about compost anymore because 
I bet you're all doing it, but I thought I would throw that in there. Um, so the other thing that a lot of people are worried about these days are invasive plants, and rightly so. Uh, this is a lovely stand of uh, garlic mustard, and as you can see, there's not, not a whole lot else other than the trees that are growing in that patch of forest. And you can also maybe see that it's very early spring and the trees are just starting to leaf out and already the forest floor is covered with vegetation. So that's, you know, that's some of the ways that exotic invasive plants get a jump on things is they leaf out way earlier than our native plants. They often put out uh, chemicals from their roots to suppress the growth of other competitors. And we also don't have a lot of pests that eat them or, or insects or predators that eat them. So that's why we try to avoid, avoid the invasive plants. Um, the State of Maine Cooperative Extension has a list on their website of the plants that are the worst offenders in Maine. And also there is a list of 33 plants that have been forbidden for sale in Maine. So that happened, I think, a couple of years ago. So they should all be out of nurseries by now. They, the nurseries had, they were grandfathered for existing stocks, but that should be everything that's out. Um, you know, it was things like Norway maple and winged euonymus and barberry and Things, things that you see, I see anyway, when I go hiking in the woods and in vast patches. Um, so we're making progress on that. Um, it's other than mechanical means, like physically uprooting these plants or smothering them, there's not a lot of, well, there's not any that I know of herbicides that will really eradicate these plants that are safe for, you know, approved for organic use. Some people do do a very minimal approach where they would cut off, say, like a honeysuckle and just dab a little bit around up on the stump or something like that. I don't really know how effective that is, but, you know, people are, people are compromising their organic principles in order to get rid of this stuff because they think, the harm that a little bit of Roundup does is not as great as the damage that these plants are doing to the environment. I'm, I don't really have an opinion about that right now. So you can, we can uh, talk about it later or you can make up your own mind. And so on the flip side of invasive plants is the whole native plant thing. People have said that if you don't like invasive plants, then you should just have native plants. Again, this is a definition issue. There's no real definition of what a native is. You could be the most restrictive and say, well, I'm only gonna plant plants that are native to say the coast of Maine between York and Bar Harbor. You could say, well, I'm gonna broaden myself out to New England plants, or you could say, I'll just do anything <clears throat> that's native to North America, as long as it's not invasive. So there's really a broad range of things that fall under the category of natives. The commercial nurseries have certainly gotten on the native bandwagon because it's a really easy label to put on things. I don't, I don't strictly do natives in my practice. I do anything that's not invasive because I really like, and my clients really like, you know, a lot of variety of flowers. And there's also, there's also the question of whether, because there's you know, a genus and species, a straight species plant, and then breeders get hold of them and do all sorts of breeding and you have multiple cultivars. Do those count as natives? 
they're improved natives. So there's there's a lot to it. Um, a lot of people like to be cut and dried about it. Native's good, not native bad, but it's really not that simple a uh, an issue to my mind. And so native or not, one of the primary products that you'll be buying when you're creating a garden is the plants themselves. Now, if you were a eggplant farmer and you were buying seedlings, those seedlings would have to be certified organic if you wanted to have organic eggplant. That is pretty hard as a landscaper to get any significant quantity of organically raised perennials or trees and shrubs. The, you know, obviously the big box stores don't carry them. Even the independent nurseries here in Maine don't carry them. The only place that I've seen them are independent growers here in the state of Maine. Uh, some of which you can find on the MOFCA certification website. If there, there's a lovely uh, a search feature on that website where you can find any farm product, but if you search for perennials, you'll find some growers. Um, I did do a brief online search uh, today, and there are a few, a few places that are offering them online. Again, you don't know what you're getting really on the internet, of course. But it is possible. And if you're not getting a full live plant in a pot of dirt, you can also sometimes get things bare root. Uh, I believe the <clears throat> many of the people who grow for Fedco in their uh, Fedco trees, where they normally sell bare root, a lot of those are organic farmers too. So you will have to hunt and search, and you won't get the variety that you went if you just went down to your local nursery. But it is possible with assiduous searching. Perennials more than trees and shrubs. I think it's really hard to find trees and shrubs that have been grown organically. But, you know, also a tree grows and lives for, you know, 100 years. So if the first four years of its life weren't organic, but the rest of its life is, that's pretty good. Uh, so the other big component of, of the landscape is the hardscaping part of it, you know, the paving, the walkways, the patios. There's not a whole lot to be said about organic and hardscaping. For me personally, I try and vo avoid the concrete products, pavers and retaining wall things, simply for the fact that there is so much energy, fossil fuel energy, required to create those things or to create any concrete that I think it's probably better to be mining stone rather than making concrete. It's still, you know, it's still environmental degradation because it's digging a hole in the ground. But and also some of this this particular shot shows some organic or some granite pavers. I I learned the a couple of years ago that the granite pavers that are sold in big box stores like Home Depot and uh, Lowe's are actually shipped here from China. It's uh, apparently somehow it's cheaper <laughs> to do that. But as far as the fossil fuel use embedded in to getting them here, I think that that's pretty bad. Um, and the other thing about hardscape is that they are an impervious surface, obviously or well, many of them are, uh, and especially in urban and suburban settings, that can become an issue with stormwater runoff. The, a lot of places, the storm drains are the same system as the sewer system. So if there's a big storm and there's a lot of water, the sewer system gets overwhelmed and raw sewage gets ejected into 
whatever body of water that the sewer system is is uh, discharging into. So if you can get water to soak into the ground instead of running off into one of those systems, that's a good thing. Um, here in Maine, there, you know, there's not a lot of places compared to maybe like Connecticut or something, but it is an issue to consider. So this particular shot, like there's a bed in the middle, all the joints between the stones are, are uh, not sealed. So water can percolate uh, down through all those cracks. And it's also a very small patio compared to the whole garden. So it's not so bad there. And, but if there is rainwater runoff, that is an issue. Um, this particular picture was a stone wall that I repaired. It's actually a seawall uh, going into it right next to a tidal cove and that culvert coming out, basically the client's entire yard drains down <laughs> through that culvert. So whatever is being put into that client's garden, if it's not used by the plants, it's going to end up coming out that culvert into the tidal estuary. So that's a really good illustration of, you know, be careful what you put down because it may not stay there. So some ways to deal with it, if you need to, um, green roofs. So the top picture, that's actually my shop with a newly planted green roof. Honestly, I live out in a very rural place, so I didn't, it's not, there's no stormwater system to overwhelm near my house, but I really wanted to build one, just sort of an experiment. Um, so that's, that's a bunch of bags that are filled with, a, 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 they're mesh bags and it's filled with a growing medium. And then you just poke a hole in the bag and plant plants. So that's like mostly sedums and things like that up there. Um, it does, it does slow down the water. I mean, once it's saturated, then the water flows, but for many hours after it stops raining, it's still dripping and trickling out of that, that pipe. So that's, it's pretty cool to look at too. I can see it from my office window, which, um, so. That's one thing. Uh, and the other two pictures are, so the one on the lower left is, it's sort of a, uh, it's a fake stream bed what it is because that's sort of the primary area where this client's yard drains. And then what it drains down to in is a bog garden, which is the other picture down in the lower right. And so all, much of this garden's water, the excess, if it runs off, collects in this low spot. So as I was saying, you know, at the beginning, if you have a wet spot, plant, wet plant, bog loving plants. So that's actually lined with, with a membrane to trap as much water as possible. And then it has an overflow. But if there's a small amount of rain that comes down, it collects in there and then the plants use it and it, or it evaporates and it doesn't just keep going down into the roadside ditch. Um, a normal, a more regular normal rain garden doesn't have a liner, it's just open at the bottom. So it could be, it could look like a, just a depression with plants in it. It could look like a small pond. Um, I actually have one of those uh, at my house too because the, the fire department parking lot is right next to my house and slopes right to my property line. So I did a smaller version of the dry stream bed with, you know, a, sort of a settling percolation pond at the bottom of it. I didn't take any pictures of it because it's not been cleaned up yet. So, um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's what I have for you this evening. And it's my, email there. 
and I'd be happy to answer questions as best I can. If anyone has any questions for Jeremy, go ahead and put those in the chat box. Oh, ideas on poison ivy eradication. Um, I've had good luck with smothering poison ivy. Um, I got a bunch of bicycle cardboard boxes that housed bicycles from my local bike shop, which are big, and you know, cut them open and spread them out. And then uh, I just, well, this was sort of in the woods, so I don't think I even put mulch on the top, but if you wanted to look nice, then you could just cover it with mulch or wood chips or something. Avoiding weed seeds in the compost. Well, that's really a function of the temperature. If you can get your compost pile hot enough, it will cook the seeds. I don't know the temperature necessarily, but that's the only method I know of, of, of making sure that your compost isn't spreading weeds everywhere. Let's see, oak leaves as mulch to build soil on top of landscape fabric. I'm not a big fan of landscape fabric. I've renovated a lot of gardens and ripped out a lot of landscape fabric. And what I've discovered is that the soil underneath tends to be much drier than it should be. So they're not as, as pervious to rain as they claim. And as a result, the roots of plants tend to congregate like right up under the, uh, the, the fabric, especially the woody plants. So yeah, shredded, shredded oak leaves by themselves to make a great mulch, but I wouldn't bother with the landscape fabric unless there's something really bad under there that you're trying to isolate. Um, wood chips as a path? I think as a path, that's fine. It's really around the plants that is problematic. Alternative plants to use instead of grass for your lawn. I think Caleb might be going into that some, so I will uh, we'll come back to that if he hasn't answered that question. Um, let's see, my green roof, too heavy. Well, <laughs> uh, that particular building was, it was an old garage that got moved on from a different place on the property. So we set it on a real foundation and we knew we were gonna do a green roof. So we beefed up the roof structure. So yeah, weight is definitely an issue. So if you find a, if you find a contractor who knows their engineering, that would be the best way to start, I think. Um, just to jump in there real quick, Jeremy, I just heard from Caleb um, and he actually lost power, <laughs> which, Oh. Which we had actually talked about as a potential thing that might happen, but um, it did indeed happen. So, um, so he is unable to make the other half of this uh, webinar. Um, so, <laughs> I guess what I would say is we will try and make um, his information available. Um, but if you have any more questions that you like, maybe Jeremy, you want to take a stab at that plants to use instead of grass for a lawn question and then people can ask questions and we can try to answer them but um yeah, I'm really yeah sorry. i can do that there's um so just clover works pretty well um it does not look the same i mean none of these look the same um someone mentioned creeping time in the chat yes or and then there's you know there's various um the very ground covers that are decent chamomile i've i've seen um uh back in my native shot that was just a, that was all moss um so actually a big part of my <laughs> front yard is just lawn because it's so acidic and shady and i've actually started trying to remove the other plants and just have the moss um um, yeah, and there's also, 
I don't remember who it was, but probably if you Google it, they were selling a, a seed mix or a, a grass seed mix called Lomo or Nomo. It was a, kind, a specific kind of native grass. I think it was called buffalo grass that just doesn't get very tall and doesn't grow very fast. So if you just mow that, it, I think it was like three or four times a year or something, it was all that really needed to mow it to sort of keep it looking a bit tidy, but it just wasn't growing very fast. Oh, and someone asked a uh, strategy for keeping weeds down in flower beds. Well, I spent a lot of my career just weeding people's flower beds. <laughs> um, so yeah, the sort of an odd thing about American landscaping or mainstream American landscaping is that people really like to look at their mulch and they really like their plants to be pretty far apart and not touching each other. So don't do that. Have your plants all crowded together so that they're shading out a lot of the weeds. And you and even if a few are poking up, they're harder to see. So um, it's not. There is no magic solution other than weeding and just trying to crowd them out. There's there are organic herbicides based on acetic acid, or you know the same as vinegar. Um, they tend to be work better on annual weeds, and they're pretty weather dependent. You really sort of need a hot day because they really work by dehydrating the plant. So. If you just have a, you know, you know, people have mobility issues or they just can't bear the tedium of, of scraping out the cracks of their patio again. Um, I do have some of the acetic acid stuff. I don't remember what it's called, burnout maybe. And I do just squirt things occasionally. Um, but then you're just left with a dead plant. <laughs> in your garden, which doesn't look that great either. Um, so, is lawn fertilizer toxic? Um, yes, you know, like ammonium nitrate base, conventional nitrogen heavy is not great for the microorganisms that really should be living in your soil. Ammonium nitrate will feed the grass and it, the rest of it will run off. You, so you could, you could probably grow grass in, you know, hydroponically if you just gave it enough, you know, ammonium nitrate. But that's not something that we want to do because, and actually too much nitrogen and too much can actually burn grass as well. Um, so there, there's a, there's a company called North Country Organics, I believe. Their product is available in a lot of nurseries around New England. Um, they have sort of a bag, granular, pretty low, low nutrient load fertilizer that I, I use sometimes. It's, uh, it's not cheap, but and it's not super, you know, there's not a lot of nitrogen in it, but that's usually good because you don't usually need a lot. And of course, if you're not taking away your grass clippings, every time you mow, you're spreading, you're re-spreading the nitrogen that the plant took up to, to grow the part that you cut off, so. Um, Jeremy, the next one, did you, can, did you catch it? Uh, I, would, I would try to, would it be viable to perform no lawn mowing or other lawn care to promote extensive prairie or lawn grasses and flowers? Um, yes. I mean, we're not in a prairie state, so you're not going to get a true prairie. You're going to get the main wildflower meadow, which I, I tell people is the cheapest option for whatever <laughs> they want to do. Uh, they don't want to spend a lot of money, but they want flowers. You just do, do nothing and wait a couple of years. You'll get flowers. Um, but, you know, a lot of 
a lot of the sort of the meadow flowers that grow in New England, they just bloom in the fall, like goldenrod and asters and things. So you're not going to have much of a display other than a grassy area or with something that looks like a grassy area without seeding it with, with other things. I, I have had clients hand me a packet of like prairie in a can kind of thing and say, make this. And I, I have not been able to get it to, to really do well in Maine. Uh, good plants to help stabilize a steep bank, uh, north facing bank. Um, yeah, someone earlier mentioned uh, ferns as a good ground cover. So they would certainly do well in a uh, in a shady situation or, you know, I mean, low light anyway. I don't know if there's trees or not, but if it's facing north, it's not getting a lot of light. Um, Pachysandra has been pretty good. It does better without tree competition, but uh, it's, I don't remember the common name of Pachysandra, I'm sorry. Um, so those are a couple options. Hmm, raised beds, crabgrass coming up through 12 inches of soil. Uh, yeah, they're wrong. You're right. You don't need to do shade cloth. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly try and like scrape off the sod before just, be, or at least dig it and flip it over before you put the 12 inches of soil on it. But that's, I would not bother with a shade cloth, no. Yeah, and um, cardboard under new beds, yep, that would probably be better than if you really, if you want to compromise with your roommate. Um, uh, is shade cloth the same as landscape fabric? No, it's not the, it's not really, although people might sell it as the same thing. Um, uh, landscape fabric, it can the heavy duty stuff is is a is a woven fabric. It's like it's almost like a tarp, except one side is fuzzy. Um, and there's also like non-woven, much lighter landscape fabric, which does not last at all and is just a mess. Uh, shade cloth is an open weave, so it allows a certain amount of of light to come through, and you can buy it in different densities. I think it, they sell it by what percentage of light it lets in. I'm trying to think what else about lawns I can tell you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the big, my fun, my fun factoid for lawns is that before World War II and the development of synthetic herbicides, lawn seed was sold with clover seed mixed into it. And once they developed synthetic herbicides, they couldn't come up with one that didn't kill the clover as well as all the other broadleaf things, so they just stopped putting it in. And then it became a weed. Um, but clover is excellent to have in your lawn because it is a nitrogen fixer. And it takes, it has a symbiotic fungi in nodules in its roots, I believe, uh, and can take nitrogen out of the air and convert it into a form that the, the grass roots can use. So don't eradicate the, the clover from your lawn. And the, a number of other weeds have been shown to be somewhat beneficial, like dandelions, for example. They you know, have a much deeper root, so they can bring up nutrients from deeper down than the grass roots normally go. Um, uh, mowing height is important. The higher, the better. You, unless you're an avid golfer, you probably don't need your lawn to be looking like a putting green because there is a correlation between the height of the grass blade and the amount of root that is growing underneath there. Because roots, you know, grass is normally, you know, eaten by an herbivore. So when that happens, when the cow comes along and chomps off half the grass, the roots kind of die back for a while. 
And then when, as the grass regrows, the roots regrow as well. So the higher you cut your grass, the more root structure you have underneath to be sucking up nutrients and water and stuff. So it just keeps it from being so stressed. And it, it's also helpful for shading out some weeds. There's some of the low creeping weeds um, that are really made happier if they can get more sunlight. So, <clears throat> um, someone asks, should one aerate one's lawn? Um, it depends. There are penetrometers, <laughs> uh, which can tell you how compacted your soil is. Um, I, I don't really have a good rule of thumb for whether it needs it or not. I guess if you notice a lot of puddling during rains, assuming it's not like a low-lying area, um, or if you take, I don't know, maybe like a trowel, assuming you're not in a drought or something, if you take a like a narrow trowel or a, or a big spike and you try and drive it in and you can't really get it very far, just with your hand, not with a hammer, I mean, um, that might be a sign that you have some compaction issues. Uh, so yeah, aeration would be helpful. Uh, there's various kinds of aerators. Uh, some are just spikes. Those aren't so great. You really want the plug kind. They, they core out a plug and, and leave it on the surface. Uh, you can rent those. And what happens is the plug breaks down into loose soil and the loose soil kind of washes down into the hole it came out of. So then you have at least a section of the soil is, is lighter and fluffier. And if you top dress compost at the same time, then some of the compost goes down those holes too. Vol, <clears throat> excuse me, voles and woodchucks. Uh, well, woodchucks, uh, trapping dogs, um, depending how lethal you want to be, I guess, guns. Um, voles, voles are a problem for me. They, in the winter time, they like to tunnel under the snow and really chew up my perennials. Um, I've had some luck with a dried blood product called plant skid. It's basically blood meal that's sort of been made, it's not really a pellet, it's sort of between a pellet and a powder, a granule, I guess. Uh, it's mostly sold as a deer repellent, but I, I've had some success if I can get it down across the beds, like right before the first snow, then it cuts down on the vole population. And it's also, it's also a good source of nitrogen, actually. Moles or grubs in lawns? Well, two very different organisms. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I tend not to worry about moles. Or moles are carnivores, so they actually eat grubs. Um, I don't know which, I'd rather have little, little mounds in my lawn, I guess, than have it, you know, denuded by the grubs. Um, grubs, uh, there, so there's milky spore disease, which is widely sold as the answer for Japanese beetle grubs. It only works on Japanese beetle grubs, and there's a lot of other grubs under your lawn. So you don't necessarily know what it is without being able to actually identify them. Um, and it's, there are online pictures about how to identify the grubs in your lawn. Uh, there's, there's something called a nematode, which is a microscopic well, they're not quite microscopic, worm-like object or animal that infests the grubs. Um, they are available commercially. I think the research has shown those actually work better in the Northeast and they are, they affect more than just the Japanese beetles. And well, skunks will eat. <laughs> well, I guess you don't really want to attract the skunks, but you know, they do eat grubs. Um, Jeremy, there was a question a ways back. Um, 
any favorite sources of unusual plants to share to share like bog plants or woodland plants um no i can't think of any names right off the top of my head i'm sorry um i because i it's more economical for me to get as many different kinds of plants as possible in one location i tend to go to the bigger nurseries like Estabrooks in North in Yarmouth and O'Donnell's in Gorham. Um, there is one tiny little nursery in, it's almost in downtown Freeport. It's like sort of tucked behind a bed and breakfast. I think it's called Shady Glen. It's on the north end of the downtown of Freeport. Of course, I don't know where all of you are from, whether you're all mostly Maine people, but um, so yeah, I think it's called Shady Glen, and they do have small numbers of some unusual things. Uh, plant some distance from the road in order to get road salt. Well, yeah, some plants are more tolerant of salt than others. Um, there's there are lists online about what the salt tolerant plants are. I think, and usually the nursery people have a pretty good uh, knowledge of that because that's a question they get regularly. I don't have a list in my head, unfortunately. Yeah, any other burning questions? Jeremy did leave his contact there if you caught that, so. Um, don't like, sh Greb's not liking shade. So if you just replace the lawn with the flowers, I don't know the answer to that. I'm trying to think if I've seen shady sections of lawn with grub damage. I probably have, um, but yeah, they don't seem to really chew on the roots of perennials. So, but I would assume that they eventually would just move to where there are roots of grasses. So. I don't really know one way or the other on that question. Jessica asks um, that she grew tall amaranth in Oklahoma, but not sure if it will work in Maine. What do you think? Did you say amaranth? Yes, sorry. Um, I'm pretty sure there are some species of amaranth that will grow in Maine. I don't know which one you were growing in Oklahoma and I don't remember the different species of amaranth anyway, but I think it is possible. Yeah, there's definitely, well, yeah, there's the, the, there's the decorative amaranth and then there's the one that's for food. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know which one. I was growing the one that was for food and it was humongous. They were like nine feet tall. They were awesome, but I think they're a heat loving plant and so I was one I'm not sure if I want to bother with it here I don't know if it'll work yeah I don't know I mean somewhere someone should have listed what zone they're they're good for so okay I'll give it a try yeah I don't know if global warming is quite that advanced yet oh here's a question about compost tea yeah I have not done a lot of lawn care so I didn't get into the compost tea um, so for those that don't know, compost tea is an aerobically produced preparation in which a small amount of compost is put in water, sometimes with some additional nutrients and aerated for a while until the microbial population that was in the compost, the original compost, multiplies to a huge degree. And then it's sprayed as a foliar, um, both nutrient and sort of protectant. I think the idea is that it sort of forms a biofilm on, on the leaves of the plants. And um, so that other organisms that are coming along don't have any place to, to get a foothold. Um, yeah, the, actually the, the, the NOFA land care course went into that quite extensively, but I took it in the, in Connecticut. So there were a fair number of people down there who 
we're either into it or we're going to get into it. Because, you know, a lot of suburban people who are thinking of transitioning from conventional to organic lawn care, they're really sort of used to that truck pulling up and the guy getting out and spraying things everywhere. Um, and they're willing to pay for that. So with the compost tea, you might as well be spraying something, something beneficial instead of whatever the nasty chemicals are that lawn companies use. I don't know if you know anything about um, voles being vegetarian, Jeremy, but um, there is a question. Are, do you think that apples would work for bait <laughs> for voles? Oh, huh. I don't know. I never actually tried to trap them. I just assumed there were so many of them that <laughs> trapping them would be a, a pointless exercise. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, the things that I see them eating are, are plant roots and but I don't know many things like apples, so it's definitely worth a try. I wonder the person who used apple, are they, what kind of traps are they? Are they like a mouse trap or are they a live trap? I, I read uh, Elliot Coleman talks about voles and, and he says to make just a little wooden box and put traps in them that they, they like to go in dark places and they'll be curious and they'll go in the box. And, we put these, we made all these boxes and put them all over the garden with, with, you know, 50 traps in them and, and got nothing almost. We got one. And, and I think it's because they were, they were, we were baiting with like peanut butter and cheese. Oh yeah. And, and they were voles and not moles. So anyway, I just tried today. I went and got a, some mouse traps and put them inside this little it's just a little wooden box it's like you know 12 by 12 and it's and a, about four inches high and it has like a little tiny door in it that yeah. is supposed to be look inviting to a for a vol well yeah i don't know if that will work or not but i i thought no wonder it didn't work if no wonder the the traps didn't work before if i was putting cheese in them well, thank you for sharing that. Um, do I have a favorite recipe for compost tea? No, I, like I said, I've never gotten into the compost tea, so 